I've been known to jump the gun a lot of times when it comes to making overreaching statements about games, and this video is no different if you couldn't tell by the title. I've had a lot of time to play games last year, as I'm sure many others had for some unknown reason, and I've come across a lot of great games, Ghost of Tsushima, the incredibly addicting Hades, Monster Train, and One Step from Eden, the relaxing simulator known as Animal Crossing, and so many other games. And that's only counting games that came out in 2020, but no game in 2020 has quite captivated me as much as VanillaWare's 13 Cent Sentinels Ages Rim, and with everyone making lists about their top games of 2020 and Thirsty Sentinels being one of the games nominated for best narratives in the game rewards, I thought I'd do my part and bring more awareness to this game because even if the year is over and 13 Sentinels didn't win it in its category, people should still play it. So here's a video about the amazing game and why you should play it if you ever get the chance. As far as I could tell, this game is pretty underrated as it got its sales not through marketing but through word of mouth. And there's a couple of reasons for that, or at least some reasons I made up completely in my head. First of all, it's only on PS4 and if I'm being honest, most people that would play this game probably aren't playing this on PS4 anymore. They are on PCs and maybe the Switch or cradling their long forgotten Vitas. If you're looking at this game on a surface level, it's a very Japanese looking game with Japanese tropes. Like it being set in a school with high school kids getting a max which is as anime as it can get. I'm pretty sure I can name 10 anime that could be described as that. The second reason is that the majority of the game is a visual novel. I'm sure even just hearing that has some people clicking off this video and writing comments about how visual novels aren't games, which I will not comment on. Usually there's a lot of reading with little player input other than clicking to see the next text box, and I get that. That could be a turnoff for a lot of people, me included if you catch me at the right time, but this game handles this in a surprisingly engaging way. Like, it seems so simple, but it went a long way in keeping me engaged. But I'll come back to that in a bit. Also, there's an actual game here. It took up about 40% of my time, which is pretty substantial if you ask me. You know what? Let's look at the gameplay right now. Destruction Mode is a real-time tower defense game nestled in a neat wireframe aesthetic. I see people dislike this aesthetic, but I like it because it gives it a more tactical feel. Plus, there are certain points where there are so many enemies that if there was more to the map, it would be extremely cluttered. I mean, don't get me wrong, it does get extremely cluttered at times and I lose track of some people, but it could have been much worse. So the way it works is that you choose up the 6 of the 13 pilots to send out and protect the terminal from kaijus. Yes, kaiju like in the movies. The people you don't send out defend the terminal, which you honestly don't really notice. I know I said it was real time, but when you pick your attacks, time pauses so you can take your sweet little time. You can move around and depending on your generation, it'll affect the path you can move. And actually, generation affects a lot of things, but I'll come right back to that. With that said, things will get out of hand if you let it. Running into the middle of a cluster of enemies and not finishing them off can really ruin your day. And if you ignore some enemies and burn your EP on random crap, they will dropkick your terminal. See, your moves call us EP and you get it back by either killing kaijus or defending which charges you up but ticks well. And as you progress, you'll get absolutely devastating moves that will take all of your AP. So it's an interesting trade off. And if you upgrade your moves, you just have to accept that you'll be only using one move before you have to actually recharge for a while. Now, I mentioned upgrades and there are a couple ways to do that. First of all, you can level up and at certain levels you get little perks that shape up the way you play them, at least for me personally. I also like how the perks tie into their story. For example, Natsumi gets damaged based on the distance she travels before she attacks which makes sense because she's in the track and field club. It's a nice little touch that gets me into the story even more. And I talked about upgrading moves but there's also upgrades you can make to the terminal. There's a lot of options here, though there is one mandatory upgrade path that gives you the other upgrades. There are some that increase your score and XP gain and then there are the rest, which have to do with your meter. You gain meter by killing kaiju and when it's 100% you can use a terminal command, things like a map wide EMP and a gravity field. More often than not, they are game changers and can really turn the tide of a fight. I always use the EMP because I feel so sick using it. And finally, there's the upgrade for the mech. You put XP into a part and the related stats go up. It does go up pretty slowly so it's more useful as kind of a post game thing, though I do recommend putting a point into brain early. See, mechs are extremely tiring to use and if you use it too much, you get brain overload. While that has some extremely long standing consequences in the story, yeah, looking at you Shinonome, all that means here is that you have to take a battle off. That does introduce an interesting strategy where you don't want to use all your best pilots at the same time because you want to save them for the harder fights. It's a cool little micromanaging bit that is invalidated by Recover, but you shouldn't use Recover, that's for scrubs. Plus it ruins your winning streak and that's the best way to get a lot of XP and easy S ranks, even on the hardest difficulty. The last important thing to talk about for the combat is the difference between the generations of the mechs. 
There's four of them and they all play extremely differently. The first generations are the heavy hitters and armor means nothing to them, making them the perfect boss killers. They could do shenanigans with shifting what mode they're in to tank or do Iron Man numbers. The second generation is the all-rounded group who can do a little of everything. They wouldn't really stand out if they didn't happen to be the best units money could buy. They get a little thing called the Sentry Gun and it tears through enemies. I honestly never had to worry about a battle because Sentry Guns are so disgusting. And then Shinonome has the audacity, the unmitigated gall to spawn two sentries at the same time. So yeah, just use Sentry Guns. Then there's the third generation who was all about long range attacks. Nothing much to say here except they do get nukes later. Finally, we have the fourth generation and their greatest assets that they can fly and do not need to adhere to any filthy streets. It makes them really good to handle the spawns that are out of the way since it's not much for them to get there. They also have interceptors which are a uh, worse sentry gun, so there's that. They're also the second best melee units, well at least Yuki is, so it's always nice to have. There's a lot more to destruction mode that I haven't even touched on, so I recommend just trying it out. I had a lot of fun with it, even if it was just trying the different moves out. There are even fun combinations like putting a decoy down on a flare trap and dropping missiles on all of them. There's something immensely satisfying about taking out so many kaiju in one fell swoop. It makes me feel like a tactical genius, especially when I get S rank and fulfill the bonus requirements, and that's all I need in real time strategies. And as the levels go on, there are harder enemies to deal with that can make you rethink your strategy, so there's a nice dose of difficulty at times. Okay, now onto the story. I should let you know now that I'm going to do my best to not spoil any of the story, and that's for a couple of reasons. The obvious one being that I don't want to ruin the experience of playing through the game and the story for the first time. Thirsty Sentinels presents some intrigue and mystery, especially near the start of the game, that reverberates throughout the entire game and leaves you constantly guessing at the memories and leaving you wanting more. You end up feeling like a detective, kind of like Yuki in her story, filling in the puzzle pieces to see the bigger picture. There were times where I thought I knew what was going on and then I would switch to another perspective and get completely thrown for a loop. Or I would get left on a cliffhanger and would have to figure out whose perspective could shed more light onto it. Even when I basically figured out what was going on, I wanted to see things through to the end because I was so invested in the characters. And I think that's what the game wanted, but I'll come back to that. If I spoiled the story, a lot of the driving motivation to play and progress through it would vanish and might even dull the experience. The other reason is because I don't think I could do the story justice. On a surface level, this game is a standard sci-fi story with time travel elements, but really there's a lot more to it. The execution notably goes out of its way to create a truly unique experience that makes the sum greater than the parts. The most obvious of this being the multiple protagonists. Switching between them gives you different stories that happen at different times. Some cross, overlap, and some don't even meet each other. Some even operate outside the going on to the other characters and it really gives this poignancy to the fluidity of time in the story. If someone is suddenly acting weird in person A's story, it might be because of something that happened yesterday in person B's story. Depending on how you progress through the story, scenes can add context to moments you've already seen or provide context to a later scene and possibly alleviate some confusion. You can have wildly different experiences just based on the order of characters you choose to play as. If I was to try and explain the story, I would either spend way too long talking about the individual stories of all 13 characters in addition to the general story as well as what's going on in destruction mode just so you can have full context, or I could generalize it to the point that a lot of the impact that the game has is lost. It's a lose-lose situation and I don't want to play that game. Okay, now on to the story. Uh, wait. Well, I, I kind of just did that in a sense, so I think I'll look at the actual execution, aka the thing that makes the game so ingenious to me. The most important thing to talk about is probably the first thing you will notice about the game. You have 13 characters to choose from, which means there are 13 stories to go through. But you know what, I'll come back to that because I want to talk a little bit about what goes on in any given story because while this is a visual novel, there is still a level of input to keep you engaged. The simplest way this is done is by making you move around the maps and stuff to talk to characters. Sometimes you don't even move anywhere and just have to re-talk to the person you were talking to. It makes it so that you don't set the controller down and wait for all the dialogue to finish. It also gives you time to look through your thought cloud. This is a place that holds key mechanics to let you hear the character's thoughts on them. Also, certain keywords can be used to trigger dialogue with people. With this in mind, there are some very, very light puzzle elements to the story. A lot of the time it's figuring out who to talk to and with what keyword. Anytime you can look at the story branches and see what you might need to do to get a branch if it doesn't outright tell you. Most of the time it's a nice change of pace to see what will trigger the next event, but there have been times where it was frustrating. There is a certain cat in a certain character story that will put you in a fun time loop if you don't use the right keyword at the right time. Luckily times like this are few and far between. There are little things in the moment to moment story sections that promote player interactivity and it really enhances the experience. 
Before I move on though, I should note that the branches aren't really branches. There aren't multiple endings or anything, it's more of choosing which section you want to do first and that's not even all the time. It's not necessarily a problem but you should know that before jumping in. Okay, back to the 13 characters. This might seem daunting at first, but it's really not. The best advice I can give is just to try out all the prologues you can and keep going on with the ones that interest you the most. I kind of touched on it, but imagine each character's story as being a different perspective and coverage of the overall story. To get the full story, you need to play through all the stories and pieces together. The cover might suggest otherwise, but there is no true protagonist as just about everyone has equal importance. Sure, Juro might feel like the MC at times, but he really isn't. It only feels that way because you'll probably do his first because he's right there and he feels like the MC in his story. But really, there is no right or wrong way to go through the story. As soon as I saw Natsuno, I barreled through her story until I couldn't anymore. Which leads me to my next point. The game wants you to try the whole game out. I wouldn't even say one, it more or less forces you to experience the whole game which is kind of a weird statement but let me explain. Remember how I said I barreled through Natsuno's story until I couldn't anymore like 10 seconds ago? I couldn't completely finish it because at a certain point I couldn't play the next part until I finished up to a certain point in Yuki's story, and she's not unique in this sense. Every character has a gate that stops you from progressing their story until you do something else. That could be doing someone else's story, getting a certain amount of files, getting X amount of characters to a certain percentage of their story, or even progressing through destruction mode. This is primarily put into place so that someone's story doesn't completely spoil everyone else's story, particularly the stories of people who are super connected. Like Megami's ending shows something that happens in Jiro's story, so you aren't allowed to finish Megami's story until you get to that part in Jiro's story. It's a great way to still give you the freedom of choosing who to play as without lessening the impact of other people's stories. Plus it gives you a reason to play destruction mode or check out people you might not have wanted to. I feel like this was a stealth reason because it truly makes you touch on everything the game has to offer if you want to have a conclusion. Like, I honestly think that if some stories didn't require destruction mode to continue, not too many people would try it out or would stop playing it after like a few seconds. And then there are the mystery files, which I'm pretty sure people glossed over but I loved it. They give you more info about the world and what's going on. If I was confused or needed clarification about something, I would head over to the files and read all the different ones and see what would be updated. Because 9 out of 10 times they would give you some extremely useful info. The last 1 out of 10 are extremely simple or obvious things that don't need an explanation, like yeah I know the nurse's office is used by the nurse, uh, thanks for taking my mystery point. I feel like those are just there to bolster the number of files so it doesn't feel like there's no points to the mystery points after a certain point. Did I say point too many times? And I think that's all I have to say about it. The fractured storytelling this game presents comes together to create an extremely compelling story that requires you to put the effort in to get the most out of the story, along with the game's mechanics coming together to give you an incentive to play all the facets of this game. It all worked out so beautifully. The last thing I'll touch on is the music. It's phenomenal and it fits extremely well into the game, especially when a particularly tense moment happens. There was a scene in Shinonome's story and I had to stop for a second and just listen to it. The best way I could describe the music is as a sci-fi or casual type of thing and it's really good at evoking emotions at the right time. And it's not just that, there's a lot of pulse pounding music that gets you into the zone to kill some kaijus. Even if you don't play the game, I recommend checking out the OST and I will put it in the description. If you want to listen to any one song, I suggest A Cruel Thesis or Deoxy Rebos because they are amazing songs. I'll also like those too. And I think that's about it. What can I say, Vanillaware did it again. Their art style is as gorgeous as usual and it fits really well in this game. The mechs and kaiju look sick and it kinda sucks you can't see them more. Also it goes without saying that the character designs are muted but effective. Everyone is different enough to distinguish them even when they go through certain things I won't spoil and uh, Yuki is still best girl. This is a game full of twists and turns and truly the best narrative I've seen in 2020 and at least top of all time for me. If you take one thing from this video is that you should try this game out for yourself if you can. I'm hoping it will come to PC or something but I have no clue if that's in talks at all. And if you do or did play 13 Sentinels, I'll leave some interviews with the writer where he talks about spoilers and answers questions. It's pretty enlightening, but let us know in the comments what you think of the game. I do try to read them all. And if you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe because it does help out a lot. And before you go feed the cat, have a good day.